Okay, so we're going to start chapter seven, uh, which is a longer chapter. So this is so the entire third test is only on this chapter. Okay, uh, in past semesters, this has been more than one chapter. So there's usually two chapters worth of information. Uh, this builds on a lot of stuff that we've talked about briefly, but you know now this kind of really gets into the the mainstay of, of our chemistry problems. All right, so there's two, two slides here on objectives. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do is balance equations, right? The, we're going to do the stoichiometry, which is really a conversion. How do we convert back and forth around chemical reactions. And the first stage of that is to balance chemical equations. So if you can't balance a chemical equation, then it's hard to do practice problems re revolving around, how do we determine how much stuff we get out of a chemical reaction? Um, the, if you think about it like, the stoichiometry is the process in which you would go to make a cake. Okay, uh, but the balanced equation is your is your recipe. So if you don't have a recipe, you may have all the ingredients to make cake, but you may not know exactly what order they're supposed to go in and how much is the amount that each, everything's supposed to go in there. And so it can make a difference when you're trying to make a cake if you don't have a, quite your recipe right, right? So balancing equations is our first, first step. And again, this is not, too terribly challenging. A lot of it is, is very relatively straightforward. Um, the stoichiometry, there's a lot to the stoichiometry. Being able to calculate different quantities of substances, or since we've already introduced aqueous things, so we have the, the flow chart that I had been working on, and I'll try and uh, do another one to insert into the, uh, into the slide deck if it's not there. But how do we work from aqueous reactants? How do we work from solid reactants? And how do we be able to express what we think we should get out of a reaction and compare it to how much we actually got out of a reaction? Because if in the limited experience you have in being in the lab already, we should have probably have already figured out that when you go into the lab and do stuff, things don't always work out the way we thought they would. And so if you're doing, if you remember the separating mixtures lab, there's always complications in trying to get towards that, those last, those last little numbers. And it, things tend, we spill something, we're trying to scoop things back in, into the container. There's a little bit of loss of product at different stages and how, and how we go about doing things. And so the actual stuff that we get out of a reaction is not always the perfect scenario that we found on, on, on paper. Okay, so but we, we want to be able to calculate how much could we potentially get, and then we could measure how much we actually get, and then be able to compare the two, okay? Um, the compounds in aqueous solutions, some of this is memorization. So we're going to look at things that are soluble, how readily things dissolve in water. So water is going to be our main component. We've already kind of talked a little bit about things like the polarity of water. And so that'll play a role in this, in this portion here of electrolytes and, and things dissolving in water. The precipitation reactions. So this will be a, a big, big portion of this chapter is looking at precipitation reactions. What happens when we put stuff in water? Okay. Uh, we're gonna have a variety of salts. Some salts dissolve in water, some don't. So we have to be able to know which particular salts are gonna dissolve in water, and there's rules for this, so you'll have to memorize some of that. And then the second part is when we take two, two solutions and we mix them together, what do we get as a product? So this was actually the, the basis for the lab that we didn't get to do this week is metathesis lab is a precipitation reaction lab. So it's a lot of taking clear solutions and mixing them together and seeing what happens. Um, acid base, we've already talked a little about acid base as far as things like nomenclature. So it's, it's more now putting some basics of reactions. Um, 
there's a whole chapter in 112 that deals with acid base reactions. So you're, you're not going to get the, this is just kind of an introductory sec segment. Um, and then oxidation and reduction. Okay, so we want to be able to determine oxidation reduction. And what this is, is, is change of electrons. Okay, so as we have a chemical reaction, we have electrons moving back and forth around, around a reaction. And we want to be able to just keep track of where things are going. Okay, uh, it's similar to think back to our electron configuration, our uh, energy diagrams, things like that where we're counting electrons. We were keeping track of where the electrons are, the quantum, the quantum numbers and things. So those were a way of keeping track of electrons. This is just another way, but it's, it's not for an individual atom. This is for a reaction. So if we react things with one another, we're going to see, we want to be able to track where, where do the electrons go. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of stuff. There's some memorization in here. In some of these sections, these are entire chapters in 112. So in 112, when you get to 112, there's actually two chapters on acid-base reactions or ones on acid base and then ionic equilibrium as well. So there's a lot of these, these same topics will show up again in 112 because they are there, there is a, some of these reactions as far as what we're going to look for are more of the qualitative, like what happens when I take this particular reaction and I mix it with this other thing. Okay. In 112, you, you'll be focusing on the numerical quantitation of those mixtures and how much are they going to dissolve? Okay. How much are they, how much product are they going to make when they do make stuff? Okay. That's not going to be quite our concern here. So that's, that'll move it down. Um, oxidation reduction is a whole chapter in 112. So there's a whole chapter on electrochemistry in 112 that we have to, that you'll, you'll come back to a lot of these same things. So my focus here is getting, making sure that you have a solid grasp on where the electrons are going. So that way, when you get to 112, that part you, you should understand readily. And then the math parts will, will come, will become, will be where you can focus on later. Okay. All right. All right. So, so we understand we already have a concept of mass. We've talked about our, our SI units, how we look at things like grams per mole. We look at, our, uh, we have our molecular weights, but when we talk about things as weighing like 180 grams per mole, that doesn't really tell us anything. I mean, that's, there's no, uh, in the example here, we can, we can look at and understand how many carbon atoms and things there are in a glucose molecule, but that doesn't really translate to an, a practical application of how much do I need to put in my coffee in the morning? Like what is, you know, what is a realistic number that I need to put in my coffee? So that's why we went quickly through like the AMU thing. So that way I'm not talking about, oh, well, you need, you know, 65 AMU for your, for your coffee in the morning. Like, but those aren't real units that anybody's familiar with. So some of this is stoichiometry is translating things to realistic numbers that we can contextualize and we can understand in the lab. If I'm going to go out and measure th something out, okay, I'm going to go measure something. I need to know how many grams am I weighing out. It, moles, they don't mean anything to us contextually. I mean, if I talk about that I have six moles of, of glucose, nobody knows how much that is. You can't, like, how much is that? So moles and things like atoms and AMU, these are less, con you know, these issues are, or units are less useful to us. So we want to translate those into real meaningful units. And so that's really what the stoichiometry stuff is, is measuring, is how do we go about measuring things? What is, as we trans, translate between various kinds of units, because the other thing we're going to come across in this chapter are chemical reactions. So if you remember back, we talked about the things like the mole. So 
when matter is conserved, okay, so if I have methane and I burn it in the presence of oxygen, I get CO2 and more, okay? It is the moles that are conserved along that reaction. So methane, the moles of carbon in the methane, so there's only one carbon in methane, so the moles, so there's one mole of carbon. And so when, it, when I burn it, I get one mole essentially of carbon, of carbon in the carbon dioxide, right? So it's the moles that are conserved across that reaction. It's not gonna weigh the same, okay? So weight is slightly different. Um, so in like Lavoisier's examples, when he, he was doing a sealed container where everything is trapped in there, but it's hard to do that with gases as we, as we measure gases, it has to be uh, in a sealed container and that presents problems as we make lots of gases because you know, what happens to a container when you fill it full of gas and things tend to explode. So we generally can't keep, it's hard to keep things all contained if we're trying to weigh them, okay? So it's the moles that are conserved, but then we have to work back to the grams that are units that we're, we're interested in, in dealing with. So chemical equations, okay? When you wanna be able to balance chemical reactions, all right? You're gonna see a couple different things on this page, okay? So most people have seen a chemical reaction before now, okay? So here we have two hydrogens, or we have hydrogen and we have oxygen making water. So what we wanna do is we have the same amount of hydrogen on both sides of the reaction. Okay, so I want to have, so I have two hydrogens here. So if we ignore the, the blue twos here, just look at the subscript. So there's two hydrogens in the hydrogen molecule and two oxygens in the oxygen molecule. When they form and they, they are constrained by the law of definite proportions, okay, remember that we talked about that in one of our early chapters of chapter two, maybe, law of definite proportions is that the molecule ratios are always going to be the same. So if I'm making water, water is always going to have H2O. No matter where we find it, it's always going to have that same ratio. So we have no control over this. We have no control over the hydrogen and the oxygen. Okay, I can't change these blocks here, right? So I can't alter the molecule, okay? So what we use is the coefficients here. So they tell us how much, what ratio do these things interact with one another in order to form the product that we want. Okay, so think about it this way. Um, if you're making cookies, okay, and it calls for a cup of flour and a cup of sugar, okay, if you only have a half a cup of sugar, that doesn't mean you can't make cookies. Right? You can still make cookies with a half a cup of sugar if the recipe calls for one cup. It's just you have to take all of your, your ingredients down by half, right? So you make half of a batch instead of a full batch of cookies, okay? So the coefficients here are like the amounts in a recipe, okay? So here, this might be, you know, two cups of hydrogen and one cup of hydrogen will give me two cups of water, right? Except our units are not cups, they're gonna be moles, right? So everything across here is the same unit of moles, so that way everything is the same, okay? So we, since we can't change the actual ratios, okay, we can't change the molecules, but what we can change is how much they interact with one another, all right? So this is what you're gonna be balancing is coming up with these ratios in order to balance these reactions, okay? So we wanna have the same number of atoms on both sides, okay? So when I have one, two, three, four hydrogens, okay, from the two molecules, right, and two oxygens here, at the end, I should have the two oxygens and the one, two, three, four hydrogens, okay? So that would be a balanced reaction, all right? So what you'll also start seeing in this, in this chapter, are the physical states of the reactions, okay? So now here we have a little more complicated chemical reaction. Uh, we have magnesium iodide and silver nitrate making silver iodide and magnesium nitrate. So again, our nomenclature stuff is gonna be come back around. So if you 
didn't do too well in the nomenclature thing, uh, it's something that you, you're going to have to come back to because it's, it's going to come back around. Right. So we still got to be able to identify things like our polyatomic ions. Okay. That's going to, like I said, I told you the guys this in the nomenclature section is that these things come back around. So knowing these things like the polyatomic ions are still going to be important for this chapter. Okay. So, but what we see here are their physical states. Okay. So we have AQ means aqueous. It's dissolved in water. Okay. So things that are aqueous are dissolved in water. Okay. Um, so here we have magnesium iodide is aqueous, silver nitrate is aqueous, and then we have solid, okay, we have a solid silver iodide, and we have more aqueous magnesium nitrate. Now we'll also deal with things that are liquid, so when we make water, for example, so in that hydrogen and oxygen might have been gases, and they may end up making liquid water, okay, uh, or as we get to the acid base section, we'll have an acid and it'll mix with water as a liquid. Okay, so water is going to be a liquid, water is not going to be aqueous, it can't, it's not dissolved in itself. Okay, and then we're in the next chapter, we'll deal with more with gases. So in this chapter, we're going to deal with solids and aqueous things for the most part. Okay. Um, there are sometimes reaction conditions. So this is more of something that you'll see probably in things like organic chemistry. Organic chemistry, you see a lot of these, these reaction conditions. So in this case, you see magnesium carbonate making magnesium oxide and CO2. And so the condition, so it does this spontaneously. It will spontaneously make, you don't have to put anything else in there. It will spontaneously make magnesium oxide upon heating. Okay, so all you gotta do is heat the stuff and then it will make carbon dioxide gas, all right? So, you'll see the conditions of the reaction here. You won't see that very much in this chapter, but it's something that comes, it comes with when we write chemical reactions. All right. Um, and so when we balance, okay, we wanna balance the elements on both sides of the reaction, all right? There's not really a right or wrong way of doing this. Sometimes it's trial and error, okay? Uh, sometimes we take a stab at it where we look at, you know, putting a number that seems like it makes sense, but then we end up having to go back and change it because it affected something else in the reaction, right? And you'll see what I talk about here in a minute, okay? So, as I said, your, your balanced equation equals your recipe, okay? If, you know, we have, you know, a chocolate cake and muffins and chocolate cookies, those recipes are going to be different. They may all include, they all may all use butter, sugar, eggs, vanilla, flour, baking soda, salt, chocolate chips, and walnuts. These things may be involved in all three of these recipes, but the ratio of those are going to be different, and then your product is going to be different as a result, okay? So if I put a lot of flour in there, I'm probably not going to come out with chocolate chip cookies if my flour is too high. I'm probably going to end up with more muffins or a cake than I, than I am cookie, right? So we want to balance those coefficients, okay? Everything in the, in the reaction is going to be in moles, right? So that makes it easy, okay? So everything is in moles. That allows us to compare apples and apples, essentially, when we start doing math. Right. All right. So here we have a balance where we need a reaction. So one of the things that you'll see on this next test after um, we're done with chapter two, the second test is there's obviously going to be problems with just balancing reactions. Okay. Where you just have to balance the reaction itself, or there is a chemical reaction given and you have to make sure that it's balanced before you start using it. Okay, so this is kind of one of those things where you just, you have a bunch of those ingredients and we can't just start throwing stuff together. We got to make sure everything is balanced before we start baking, right? So here we have aluminum and oxygen making aluminum oxide, okay? Now, the only suggestion that I have as far as how to go about doing this is to leave things, now in this case it's both of these are elements, so my guideline would be to leave lone elements to last, 
okay? So if we have a reaction where there's complex molecules interacting, but you have like oxygen in there, leave the oxygen till last to, to balance, okay? In this case, I would leave the single, the simplest elements, leave the simplest structure to last, okay? So in, in most cases, when, when we're doing uh, chemical reactions or we're doing like our conversion charts, I said, start with the simplest thing. So pick the simplest unit for you to start with. Here, I'm saying, leave the simplest thing to last. Okay, so the simplest element here is aluminum, all right? There's just, it's one, one aluminum, that's it. Here we have two oxygens, so obviously if I change this amount, it's gonna be affected by the, by the subscript here, okay? Um, so we wanna have the same number on both sides of our reaction. So this is really where we look at common denominators, okay? So I have three oxygens over here and two oxygens on this side. Okay, so obviously I can't change the formula, okay? But if I wanted to have the same amount, then I would need to multiply this product by two, okay? So if I put a two in front of this, everything in the molecule gets multiplied by two, okay? So that becomes two aluminum and six oxygen, okay? And then I would have to balance that out over here by putting a three coefficient in front of the oxygen, Okay, so we put a three coefficient in front of the oxygen, and now I have three times two, makes a total of six, and two times three makes a total of six. Okay, so in this case, we would say the oxygen is balanced. Then we could come back and look at the aluminum, where here we have two as the coefficient, times two, it's subscript, so a total of four, and then you can just slap the four on over here if that's um, where you're balancing, okay? So this is where it depends on where you start, okay? But you can still end up in the same spot. So let's just say you started with the aluminum, okay? Let's say, for example, we started with the aluminum and you put a two here in front of the aluminum, right? The aluminum is gonna be balanced, right? And then we'd have to come back and say, oh, okay, well, I still got to do the three and the two over here to balance the oxygen, which then is going to go back and change that initial value for the aluminum. So it can be a little bit of give and take. So you sometimes have to go back and fix problems that you started with. Yes, absolutely. Good question. So yes, we can only change the coefficients. Okay. So I can't change the fact that oxygen is O2. Okay, so we can't like make that O3 because then that becomes a different molecule, right? That becomes ozone, right? So we're, we're fun if you change the co the subscript, it fundamentally changes the molecule that you're working with. So we can't do that. Okay, so again, in the in the example of the baking, if I'm trying to use sugar, I can't like you know cut my sugar in half to make half a sugar molecule, right? So just because I needed less carbon in my, my reaction. So you, you can't fundamentally change the reaction. You can't change the, the subscripts, but we can change how much of it there is, okay? And so this is all in moles, okay? So let's read what this says. Four moles of solid aluminum react with three moles of oxygen, of gaseous oxygen, and it makes two moles of solid aluminum oxide. Okay, so everything here is in moles. So it's four moles of aluminum, three moles of oxygen, make two moles of aluminum oxide. Okay, now this is a little bit more complicated one. Same guideline as before here, I would leave the aluminum to last, okay? Aluminum is the simplest structure, okay? Now, the one thing that you have to recognize is that you don't have to balance every single element by itself, okay? Let me just talk about what I'm you know, talking about here. Here you have, what you should recognize is acetic acid, okay? C2H3O2 with the hydrogen in front. So this is acetic acid, okay? So 
the C2H3O2 is the acetate ion, right? You have C2H3O2 right here. So you have the acetate ion that is just moving as a chunk from here over to here, okay? So you don't have to count the individual carbons in there. You can count that as a whole unit, okay? You can count things in a unit wise, okay? So this chunk, there was one of them on the reactant side and there are three of them on the product side, okay? So you can, you can look at this as a whole chunk in order to balance this out, okay? Um, now, again, it depends on where you start with this, okay? But you'll see here, you've got, if I was starting with the acetate, okay, you would have probably started with a three, all right? It would have put a three over here to start with, right? The, and made, you know, three hydrogens, but then you would have need to balance the number of hydrogens over here, which again affects this, right? Because there's, so it requires a little bit of back and forth, maybe initially until we recognize like where we might start with this. Um, even if you started with the hydrogen, you still end up with a little bit of back and forth as you move across the reaction. So if we started with the hydrogen, okay, we start with the hydrogen, there's two hydrogens. So, you know, again, the acetate's already accounted for here. So I probably wouldn't look at the acetates as in like counting individual hydrogens. I'd be looking at this hydrogen here. So putting a two here would then make two acetates and I need three really. So you'd have to go back and forth a few times here to figure out what is, what is the common denominator you're trying to shoot for here, okay? And then when you get down to the end, we, we'd need six total, right, in order to, to balance out, have an even number. You can't have, now you can, you can use fractions, okay? You will see fractions, okay? It's just like saying in my recipe, I need half a cup of sugar, okay? I don't need a full cup, I can use half cups, all right? So you can have half a mole, right? I just can't have half of a molecule, right? I can't have half of an aluminum, right? But I can have half a mole of aluminum, right? Because a mole is the, the chunk, the substance, the amount of stuff, right? So it's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of aluminum in a mole. So if I have half of that, I still have a lot of aluminum, okay? I still have a lot of mole or a lot of atoms of aluminum, right? So we can have fractions in here. So don't worry too much. And if you see that, it can happen. A lot of times what, what people will do is multiply, like if this was like half, that they'd multiply everything through by two to get rid of the fractions. So you'll also see that kind of thing as well, okay? All right. So let's try it out. Say, uh, all right, see if our poll everything everywhere works. And uh, let me pull mine out here. Okay, so let's see if. Hmm. I'm not seeing anything. Hang on one second. Maybe I can. Let's try this. Okay. 
Okay, should pop up. There we go. All right. It's working now. I don't know if you guys can see the switch over to this. So maybe we were able to see the presentation now or see the poll everywhere. So when we look at this, so we have uh, propane and oxygen making CO2 and water, okay? So we can already see that the carbon, okay, there's three carbons on, on both sides from the carbon dioxide, okay? So the carbon is balanced here. We have four moles of water, which then is four times two, okay, so the subscript on the two, so that makes a total of eight hydrogens, so that balances the eight over here, okay, so really you just have to total up all the ox all the oxygens that are in the product here, right, so we got four from the water, right, and three times two giving us six, right, so that gives us a total of ten oxygens as the product, and so since oxygen is already two, then five is going to be the answer we're shooting for, right? So five would be the coefficient, right? Because we want to end up with a total of 10 oxygens, okay? So again, when you look at the coefficient, like for the three for the carbon dioxide, it's three times everything there. So the subscript here becomes three, three carbons, and six oxygen. So three times two gives you a total of six oxygens and four times one giving us four. Okay, so then six and four giving us a total of 10 and then half of that really because it's a diatomic. Okay. So not quite sure why the video didn't share or why it didn't show up on there. So one of those bugs we'll have to keep working on. All right. So let's take a look at the stoichiometry. We'll introduce some of this and then we'll take a break. Okay. Um, I'm not going to stop the 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 video. I'm just going to have us pause for a few minutes and I'll just turn off the, the video or the PowerPoint for a few minutes so everybody can take a break. Um, all right. So stoichiometry, we are looking at calculating the quantities of stuff, right? Um, what I will probably do, okay, so to take a step back, what I'll probably do is I'll post up some practice problems on balancing. So you get your hand at it. And like I said, we'll, once I figure out how to do some practice problems on here, I'll be able to walk through some other examples. Like I said, I, I just don't have anything prepared in the PowerPoint that allows me to do, uh, do any practice problems in this, this setup. All right. So, I mean, I've got a whole book of practice problems done uh, that I can't use. Okay. All right. So, we want to calculate quantities in a reaction. And that phenomenon or technique is called stoichiometry. Okay, so we want to have a balanced equation and then we can calculate how much stuff do we get out of it. All right, so this is similar, this is kind of a graphical version of the, the balanced equation or my, my process flow chart. Okay, so. It looks a little different than, I, than how I wrote it up on the board because it's in PowerPoint, right? But 
you should see, you should recognize some familiar elements here. Okay. The top of my chart was the mass. Okay. And then as we converted down to moles of something, we used the molecular weight, right? If we started from the volume of something, okay, we could convert to moles using the molarity, right? There's also the connection here between mass and volume, which was done by density, right? So we had density that allowed us to convert between volume and mass, okay? And then we had particles. So this is like the, the first test, okay? So if we wanted to know how many molecules there were, we needed Avogadro's number, okay? If we had one mole of substance, well, every mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, so that's how many molecules you would have, right? So this chapter introduces this thing here in the middle, the balanced equation, okay? So the balanced equation allows us to convert from moles of one thing to moles of another thing, okay? So because the balanced equations, like in the previous example here, Okay, because this is moles of aluminum and moles of acetic acid making moles of aluminum acetate and moles of hydrogen, I can convert from moles of aluminum to moles of hydrogen, okay? So because they're both the same unit, right? I'm talking about the same thing, right? So, in this chapter, as we do stoichiometry problems, you will find that most, if not all of the problems in stoichiometry can be done in three steps, okay? You shouldn't need to go too much more than three steps in order to solve most of the stoichiometry problems, okay? So if we are going to convert from say, uh, that aluminum, okay, we had aluminum, right? And the product that we wanted to get out was the hydrogen, okay? So starting from the mass of aluminum, we would have the molecular weight, which would get us the moles. We use the balanced equation where there's those coefficients, to convert to moles of the other product, and then the molecular weight of the second product to find its mass, okay? So let's go back to this, or right here's the, so essentially, here's my flow chart here, okay? So in that problem for aluminum plus acetic acid making aluminum acetate and hydrogen, if, I'm con if I know the mass of the aluminum, I know the molecular weight of aluminum, I can find out how many moles of aluminum there are. I balance that equation, and so there is a ratio of aluminum to hydrogen that I would use. Those are numbers. We use the, the numerical coefficient as a number to convert between the two values. I can convert to moles of hydrogen as my product, and then I can know them and I know the molecular weight of hydrogen so I, then I could find how much mass of hydrogen would I get out of that reaction okay but you'll see here one two three okay most of these can be done in these three steps okay now we're, we'll keep building on this um, in this chapter there will also be volume so we'll be doing aqueous reactions but those are the same thing okay we're going to have one two three so here i could have an aqueous starting so if in that same problem i was looking at acetic acid right so acetic acid would be a liquid or an aqueous uh, solution so i would need to know something different about the acetic acid but i could go from the acetic acid to how much mass of hydrogen could I make, okay? And it'd still be one, two, three steps. Okay. So most of the stuff can be done in three steps, all right? 
All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a 10 minute break. Okay. So we're kind of a little more like eight minutes or so. Um, so we'll go ahead and do. Uh, so I will probably pause the recording here. Zoom recording. Okay. All right. So break. All right, so we have our, this is our first example here, okay, where we want to calculate and let me move my stuff around here so I can see, All right? We have a balanced equation, okay, so uh, you'll get used to seeing kind of complex balanced equations being given. Um, on the test for this particular one, you will see a mixture of both balanced and unbalanced reactions. You want to make sure that you check it, that it's balanced before you start doing anything, okay? But we have 50 grams of sodium chloride, and we want to know how much chlorine can be produced, okay? So according to our flow chart, okay? So if we Look back at our flow chart here. Okay, we have the mass of sodium chloride, and we want to know the mass of chlorine. Okay, so we have three steps. Okay, the molecular weight of the sodium chloride, our balanced equation, and then the molecular weight of the chlorine. Okay, so we have our 50 grams of sodium chloride. And here is the molecular weight. Um, on the next test, I will probably give you molecular weights again, because you're gonna have a lot of molecular weights and, and you're not gonna have time to really spend time calculating molecular weights for everything. So a lot of them will be given in the problem, right? So the new part here is the balanced equation, okay? I'm converting from, okay? So what you're converting from is gonna be on the bottom to what I'm converting to that's on the top. Okay, so two moles of sodium chloride are converting to one mole of chlorine. And that's in the coefficient, and the numbers here are the coefficients in the balanced equation. Okay, so here's the two that come from the sodium chloride, and the one that's not apparently written. Okay, we don't write one usually in the in reactions, but the one mole for the chlorine. Okay, so this is why if it's not balanced, this number ratio here gets thrown off, okay? And your results are totally wrong, okay? And it can be wrong real fast if this ratio is not right, okay? Then the last is the molecular weight for the chlorine, right? And then you get about 30 grams of chlorine produced from the 50 grams of sodium chloride, okay? One, two, three. Molecular weight, balanced equation, molecular weight. Okay. Um, here's where you'll start to see there's a variety of ways that we're going to see uh, his, these equations put together, okay? The first and most common way is reactant to product, okay? So this is where here we have cobalt nitrate, okay? And we wanna know how much cobalt sulfide will be formed, okay? So this is probably the most common kind of, uh, of these problems that we have is we wanna know how much product can I make, okay? How much product am I gonna make from, from this reaction? Okay, we're given the mass of the, the starting product, okay? We have its molecular weight, okay, that's given as part of the problem. We have the balanced equation, so it's a two to one ratio. So there's for every two moles of the cobalt nitrate, that's what I'm converting from, so that'll be on the bottom. It converts to one mole of cobalt sulfide, and then the molecular weight for the cobalt sulfide is given, okay? So one, two, and three. Okay. Um, 
And so here you see, see it put into place, okay? So the 541 grams is where I'm starting, the mass. The grams per mole, the molecular weight. For every two moles, again, the bottom portion is what, it's got like an extra parenthesis in there, um, is what I'm converting from to what I'm converting to on the top, okay? And the two is from the coefficient, and the one is from the coefficient from, from the product and then the molecular weight of the third product, okay? All right, so this becomes another kind of question that we have on this, on this test is, what is the limiting reactant, okay? Uh, as the, the slide indicates, right now, everything I've talked about so far is just assuming that we didn't have anything else. So let's take a step back. There's a second reactant right here. The ammonium sulfide is in this problem, okay? But if it's not listed, we assume there's a lot of it, okay? We would call that excess, okay? So it's excessive. And so we don't worry about this as, as a reactant, okay? So everything is generated based on this, okay? But what if we have some of this, okay? So one of them is gonna be the driver of the reaction, and that's called the limiting reactant, okay? So the product, how much product I can make is driven by my limiting reactant, okay? So think of it, think of it this way. If you're going to cook hot dogs on the grill, okay? We got summer starting, we're out cooking hot dogs and stuff, or I'm gonna have a big barbecue, I'm gonna be cooking all day long. How much stuff you can cook is dependent on your combustion process, right? We're burning propane, you got a propane tank, and it's using oxygen to make CO2 and water and heat, okay? The amount of stuff that you're gonna cook is dependent on how much fuel you have, okay? When the propane runs out, your reaction stops. You're not getting any more heat because you've run out of propane, okay? The oxygen, is from the atmosphere. You're not gonna consume the entire oxygen from the atmosphere making hot dogs, okay? The propane is gonna, is gonna run out. The propane is the limiting factor in how long you can cook, okay? So in these chemical reactions, there is going to be one thing that is a driver for how much product I can make, okay? Um, it's not always gonna be apparent, Okay, it's not gonna be picking the smallest number. Okay, it doesn't always work that way. Okay, now there's a couple of methods in which we can do this, and so I'll show you one of them, right? So, but the, the limiting reactant is, it's like the saying of like, you know, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, right? Well, a reaction only goes as long until its limiting reactant runs out, okay? So the reaction stops when the limiting reactant runs out. So when something runs out, then the reaction has to stop, all right? So here's an easy example, okay? Like I said, it, they're not easy like this. You don't see these, these kinds of reactions. So here I have my recipe for making a sundae, okay? Two scoops of ice cream, one cherry, and 50 milliliters of syrup makes one sundae. Okay, now if I have a whole lot of ice cream and a whole lot of cherries, but I only have 100 milliliters of syrup, okay, I can only make two sundaes. Okay, one sundae uses 50 milliliters, and the other sundae uses 50 milliliters. But I got a whole bunch of leftover ice cream and cherries, but I can't make any more sundaes. Okay, so the ice cream and cherries are excess and the amount of sundaes is the limiting reactant. It is dependent on how much syrup I have, okay? So there's, there's a couple ways that we can do this, okay? So one way that is done is When you have, okay, so we have two, so in this case, we're gonna have two reactants, okay? So we don't know which one is the one that's identifying, okay? So we can do either a 
a ratio calculation. Okay, which I don't, you'll see this used. I don't really use this method. So um, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm just going to explain it. There is a way of doing this, all right, based on um, what is the ratio of the, the elements, like the, the mass to mole ratio of the two reactants. And then whichever one is smaller, he's going to tell you what, that that's the limiting reactant. Okay. I, I don't particularly tend to use that one. Okay. Um, the way that I will generally do this is calculate how much product I could make from each reactant. Okay. Now, in a lot of these problems, they're not generally asking what is the limiting reactant. They want to know. We want to know what is the, how much product can I make. Right. That's usually the end goal is what how much product we can make. So, if we just go ahead and calculate that. It doesn't change our method. Okay, that's how that's how we solved all. Of, that's how we looked at those first problems. There's still three steps, but we just do it twice. Okay, so we do how much product from from reactant A can I make? How much product from reactant B can I make? And then compare the results. Okay, so that's generally how I, how you'll see me do this. Okay. So here's an example, okay? We want to know how much sodium sulfate will be produced when we have a certain amount of the sodium bicarbonate and of the uh, sulfuric acid, okay? So All right, so what you'll see here though, is we have, so both of these are in grams, okay? So we're just doing mass, mass of both, all right? So the mass of each reactant, the balanced equation to the moles of the product and then mass of the product. And I'm just gonna do this twice, okay? All right, so here's what it looks like. Okay, so my sulfuric acid is in blue, my sodium bicarbonate is in green. Okay, so this is what am I starting with? Okay, step one is the molecular weight. Again, both of these are given as or we can find in the problem. Okay, so this is not anything that's um, unknown really. Okay, so sulfuric acid, 98 grams per mole. Okay, so this is the molecular weight of sulfuric acid, 84 grams per mole for the sodium bicarbonate, okay? The second part here is the balanced equation, all right? So you're gonna see for the sulfuric acid here in the bottom, all right, is one mole of sulfuric acid I'm converting from, okay? Again, my terms are opposite here. Again, that should be helping you to, to determine what, what goes into the next spot, okay? Moles of sulfuric acid to the sodium sulfate that I want to find. Okay, so both of these are one to one. Okay, and then my third step is the moles, grams per mole of the sodium sulfate. Okay, sodium bicarbonate, same steps. Molecular weight, balanced equation here is slightly different because there's two moles of sodium bicarbonate for every one mole of the sodium sulfate. And the last step is the same, the molecular, same molecular weight for the product, right? So what we get here is two, two different numbers, okay? And so this is where, where your driver is, okay? Whichever one is smaller is generally your answer, okay? So if we wanna know how much product we can make, the reaction stops at seven grams, okay? I have enough sodium bicarbonate to make up to 12 grams, but my, I'm not gonna reach 12 grams of product because it stopped, this, this reactant here ran out at making seven grams, okay? So the seven grams is how much I can make, and then therefore 
the sulfuric acid is the limiting reactant, okay? So this came from the sulfuric acid, which is the limiting reactant, okay? Um, look at another example here. This one is dealing with aqueous things. Okay, so same same setup. Nothing has changed. Okay, here we have. We want to know what is the volume of the so of the ammonium, or what volume? What volume of ammonium hydroxide? So we have ammonium hydroxide is needed to react with. This many milliliters of acetic acid. Okay, so this is this is a separate kind of problem. All right, so look here, we're talking about ammonium hydroxide and acetic acid. This is what's called a reactant reactant problem. Okay, so our balanced equate or our method flow chart still works. Okay, A and B don't have to be reactant and product. Okay, this is agnostic of what compounds you're dealing with. Okay, A is just A, it could be anything. B is just some other compound. Okay, these can, in this case, these are both reactants. Okay, so this is a common kind of, this is a second kind of problem. So, the, so the, the first one was I have a reactant and I want to know how much product could I make. This one is, I have a certain amount of reactant and I wanna know how much other reactant do I need to make these react, right? This is commonly done because we don't wanna waste chemicals, okay? So um, think of it too as like, if, you know, if you're making a mixed drink, okay, you want, the right amount of what your drink is going to taste like, right? So I don't want to just up, you know, if you tip, put a, you know, 200 milliliters of orange juice in a glass and then just fill the rest of it with vodka, yes, technically that's still a screwdriver, but it, it's just going to taste like orange vodka, basically, right? It's not going to taste like it's supposed to, right? So the amount of stuff there, we don't want to just, you know, and or if you're thinking about it from the perspective of you own the bar and you've got bartenders, you know, fill, filling drinks where they're filling a glass with, you know, 75% vodka and 25% orange juice, you're going through a lot of vodka. Okay. That's why they water down your drinks, right? That's why they fill it up with ice first and then they start putting stuff in there, right? Because it cuts down on how much stuff they're putting in there, right? So we want to use just the right amount of stuff in our in our reaction okay so i don't want to go overboard with this right so think of this thing another example would be um this is an acid okay so acetic acid is an acid ammonium hydroxide is a base okay if i spilled acetic acid on the floor okay i generally want to know how much base do i should i put on it to neutralize it okay i don't want to add too much base because then I go from being having an acid spill to having a base spill. Okay, so I want to use just enough to neutralize the the acids and base the acid that's that I spilled. Okay, so I'm only concerned about the reactants. Okay, all right. So I'm going from volume of A, which in this case was my ammonium hydroxide. Okay and I wanna know how much acetic acid am I gonna get, all right? So still three steps, okay? My volume of acetic acid here, you'll notice I converted from 45 milliliters to liters, okay? Uh, the easiest way to convert this is to move the decimal place three times, okay? So if we go 45, one, two, three, so it's 0 0.045 liters. Because the molarity is in, in liters, moles per liter, all right, so here's moles per liter. So this is my molarity of the, yeah, so I have acetic acid. I'm starting with the acetic acid and I wanna know how much ammonium hydroxide I do have, All right? So 2.65 
mole, right? So we just talked about the units of molarity, right? So the molarity is moles per liter. Okay, so that's that first step is moles per liter. The balanced equation, they're both one to one, right? So there are two ones there. And then the molarity of the sodium hydroxide is given as 0.85 moles per liter. Okay, so step one, step two, step three. The end result is the liters of ammonium hydroxide. Okay. And so you're going to see the same, the same repetition. So by the time we get through this chapter, hopefully, how we go about doing this, we'll, you'll have seen this enough times that you'll start to recognize that we're, the three steps become repetitive, okay? Is that you should be doing three steps for most of these processes, okay? And the same three steps are gonna show up all the time, okay? All right, so what are we gonna do with this information, all right? All right, hang on one second, let me see. What, oh. overload us too much with, with some of this because it's gonna be a lot to digest in one evening. All right. All right. Hang on. Get back to this. All right, so we got a few more slides left. We'll finish this, finish this segment up. All right, so usually in these problems, okay, so you'll notice a little star at the stop here. Well, hang on one second. A chat window disappeared, so. All right. Um, All right, so the theoretical yield is a common question that we're looking for, right? So when we're doing these, these problems, the theoretical yield is the maximum amount that we can make out of a reaction. Now, this is technically what we've already been doing. I just didn't call it theoretical yield, okay? When we were calculating how much product could I make, okay? So if we go back to, go back here to this to this problem of sodium chloride and I don't know how much chlorine I can make it's literally it's really asking what is the theoretical yield of this reaction how much can I get on paper so when we look at this when we do this on paper if I take sodium chloride and water and apply electricity I get 30 you know 30 grams or something uh there's, there's an x in there maybe there was supposed to be more to this um uh, so roughly around 30 grams maybe if the math is right there so we should get about 30 grams of chlorine gas right but when you try and do this in the lab you're never gonna you're not gonna collect 30 grams of, of chlorine gas it says it's not gonna work like that so this is on paper, this is the theoretical yield. How much could we get if it was perfect, okay? And so that's what the theoretical yield is really asking for is how much could we get maximally, optimally on paper if everything worked out fine, okay? The actual yield, you can't calculate, okay? The actual yield is the, how much you actually got out of doing the reaction, okay? This would have to be measured physically from conducting the experiment, okay? And then the percent yield is, that's where the money is. That's where the, uh, the chemist puts the stock in the percent yield, okay? If I come up with a synthesis for a drug that cures cancer, but I have a 2% yield, Okay, that's not great, okay? It doesn't matter how amazing that is, that's a lot of waste. I'm dumping a lot of stuff in there to get 2% out, 
okay? So my synthesis or any chemical reactions that we do, the percent yield really translates to, to, to our money, right? So I want a high yield reaction. I want to put stuff in and I want to get the most out of my reaction, okay? So percent yield is sometimes things like, you know, how we go about doing the reaction. It's not always the chemical's fault, okay? It's usually sometimes our fault, right? So it's, as I'm not spilling stuff as I, you know, transfer um, reactions. It's one of the things that um, when we try to do in, in some chemical synthesis is what's called one pot. It's like making chili, all right? Chili is kind of hard to mess up, right? You dump it all into one big pot and you put it and you put it to cook, right? It's like no fuss, right? Everything goes in there and at the end of the day, you're going to end up with chili, right? So the synthesis where we don't have to take stuff out and move it to another spot, okay? Anytime that you transfer chemicals from one spot to another, okay, you're going to lose some, right? There's some residue left over, okay? So now this is not always super important when we're cooking, you know, if we're, you know, not scraping the pot of every little thing that's, that's in there to get it all out, right? But if we're doing chemicals and we need all of that, then we want it to be as precise as possible. And so if I lose product as I transfer from one device to another, to another device, and I'm losing a little bit every time, my percent yield is going down every time, right? And so I don't wanna go through those kinds of things. And so how we develop our methodology of doing our synthesis it can improve our percent yield. Okay, it's, it's a lot of it is how we handle things, not necessarily the, the chemicals being reactive. Okay. Um, all right. So here's a quick example here. We have 12 grams of carbon dioxide reacts with eight grams of water to give seven grams of the glucose. Okay determine the percent yield of glucose in this reaction. So the seven grams, seven and a half grams right here, this is the actual yield, okay? This is how much we got out of the reaction, okay? So we need to determine how much could we have gotten first, okay? What is my theoretical yield, right? So we're gonna do this in two, two steps, okay? We're gonna do them side by side. So I have 12 grams of carbon dioxide and eight grams of water. I don't know which one is my limiting reaction. You can't just look at it, Okay, now you could pick the eight grams, maybe, all right? Maybe you pick the eight grams and you get lucky, okay, that water is the limiting reactant because there's less of it, right? But that's not always the case, okay? Because oftentimes this ratio here is not, is not the same thing. And so sometimes there's, this ratio can be different and that can throw off just, you know, looking at the, you know, how much product we can get. Okay. All right. So I'm still same process here. Mass of A to moles using the molecular weight, the balanced equation, and then the molecular weight. Okay. So here we're going to see my grams of carbon dioxide, the molecular weight of carbon dioxide. There are converting from carbon dioxide to sugar. So six moles is the coefficient to one mole and the molecular weight of the glucose. From the water, eight grams of the water, the molecular weight. So here again, the molecular weights play a big role in how much product there is. Yes, it's only eight grams of water, but the molecular weight for water is so much smaller that it doesn't impact it as much, right? So we got six moles occurring from the water to the glucose, and then the molecular weight of the glucose again. So here now we have eight grams, so whichever one is smaller is where my reaction stops, okay? So I get eight grams is my theoretical yield, okay? This comes from the carbon dioxide, which is the limiting reactant, okay? So it is not the water, it is the carbon dioxide that is, that is the limiting factor. So you can't just look at it and say, well, this one's smaller, so I'm gonna go with that, okay? So it's not as easy as like the, you know, the making banana sundae or making ice cream sundaes example, where we can clearly look at it and just 
pick which one obviously is going to be the limiting factor. Okay. All right. So my CO2 is my limiting reactant. Okay. Um, Oh, and then what it actually, that wasn't, that wasn't the end. Now let me go back to the last step of this reaction. All right, so the eight grams is my theoretical yield, okay? Then I need to take the theoretical yield and I need to put that with the, the actual yield, okay? So the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100. So the actual yield was given as the 7.5 grams and the 8.1 grams is my theoretical yield. So on paper, everything should have worked out perfectly and I should have gotten eight grams of product, but I only got seven and a half. So my percent yields about 90%, right? Which is pretty good, right? Most, most chemists would be happy with a 90% yield, okay? So it, you know, obviously if we're you know, re doing really well, we would shoot for much higher, but you know, anything less than 90% is not, you know, it's generally not stellar for, for a, a chemical reaction. Okay. All right. All right. So that's where I'm going to stop with that for tonight. Okay. There's a, there's a lot of, it's a lot of stuff to cover. Um, there's still more to cover, but I don't want to like, you know, rush through all of this. Again, we can record this and I can, like I said, I can always record other videos um, once I get a chance of how do I do practice problems. Um, and we can, um, you know, we'll, we'll circle back to some of the, uh, some of the practice problems on this chapter. And like I said, let's, let's look real quick at the, our schedule here, Let's see where we're at. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not planning on doing the next exam until the 13th of April. So we've got, so, so we got a, we got a couple of weeks to, to, to work on this chapter and start working on the next stuff. Um, so, and now that we don't have labs, it's like, you know, I, we, I think we can afford to like, you know, take, you know, take a slower pace here on, and not push too hard on some of these things. So they don't have lab nights to, to, to bog us down so we can, um, we can fill in time as we need it to, to get through the, through a lot of this. So, um, so yeah, so let me see some questions. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, the, I haven't got there there wasn't extra credit on the test because i had to make basically a new test for canvas and so it was harder to um to do to come up with extra problems um so the test is just out of 100 points um we'll see how everybody does first um you know to be honest with you i mean i um i don't know what the average is going to look like i'm presuming that it's probably going to be really good would be my guess right so um, yeah, if you guys do really well in the test, then you probably don't really need extra credit. Um, but you know, it's, uh, we'll, we'll see how, we'll see how the average goes and we'll see how everything goes after I get done grading. And like I said, I got makeup assignments. I got to start putting together anyway. So, uh, yeah. So, I mean, so, so I'm sure there will be, there will be chances for extra credit probably in some of the other assignments that I'll, that I'll put up. Um, like I said, so um, you won't be from a lack of points. So, and it's, it's probably easier to get extra credit other places rather than trying to shoot for like 108 on the test. Um, so uh, you'll probably be more likely to get extra credit if I put it somewhere else. Um, so, but yeah, we'll, there'll, there'll be an extra, you know, extra credit assignment coming up because I'll, I'll have other stuff to other stuff to do. Um, so, but we should be working on our, working on our research paper. Okay. That's still going to be a big thing. You should be working on your, your bibliography. Um, let's see if there's any other things I missed here. Oh, 
yeah, my dog's name is Zod. So, uh, and, uh, and Bella is my, my older dog. But um, so uh, other than that, that is all I have for the evening. I said, we don't have to push it too hard. We're gonna have plenty of time to, to get through these and